Father, we come before you and we ask for your understanding as we read your word, that you would drive it home to our hearts. <clears throat> Lord, that we would know you better when we leave than when we came. And we might be in awe, Lord, of what you have done through the ages. And so I ask you to take this book of Hebrews that has some, some significant passages. I pray they would be clear, they would be simple, we would understand, Lord, how we ought to rightly walk with you, having received a better covenant, and that these things would drive home to our hearts. So be with us now, we pray, and bless the time in your word. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews, take a look at verse 1. <clears throat> First word we hear is God. Okay. How's that different from, example, the last number of epistles we've been through? Usually they would start with Paul, or when we get to James, or we get to Peter, or we get to others. And so here, interestingly enough, we go right to God, and we're not told who wrote the book. So that's one of the questions. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Now, if this doesn't mean much to you, you've got to bear with me for a few minutes, but there's lots of theories. Some say Paul, some say Apollos. Uh, others will say, for example, Aquila and Priscilla, or Silas, or Barnabas. Uh, some say perhaps even Clement of Rome. Um, but now that brings up an interesting thing we need to know. So number one, top of the org chart, the Lord Jesus. How many know the Lord? Have I lost anyone yet? The Lord Jesus, top of the org chart. Fine. He called those who followed him, and we call them his disciples. And there were, 11, there were 12 in particular. Paul would be added later when they went down to 11, called the apostles. And so you have Jesus, and then you have the apostles and the disciples, and that includes the 11 plus Paul, plus, for example, Aquila and Priscilla, plus Apollos, plus those 120 from the upper room, plus those 500 who saw him risen at one point from the dead. You've got this band of people who are direct eyewitnesses to the ministry and teachings of Jesus. Is everybody still with me? That half is. Is everybody still with me? That half is kind of with me. Fine. Jesus, then we have this band, okay? Then we have those who were evangelized by those eyewitnesses. And that is the generation of the church going into the 100s. We call them often the leaders of that generation, the church fathers. And of course, they shared their faith with others. And so now you're getting from first century to 100s to 200s to 300s. And you've got these band of, of groups of people that have become believers from the testimonies that came directly from Jesus through the eyewitnesses to the next generation, which the leaders are called the church fathers, to the generation after that, which gets you into about the third century plus. And so when we study, for example, the book of Hebrews, when we get to the 300s, when Constantine takes over, the church began to have some discussions of, listen, we were suffering persecution under Nero and other, the other emperors, and many people died who claimed faith in Christ. And so if we're going to die for our faith, we want to make sure we're reading the right books and make sure these books are the inspired books, the word of God. And so they began a process called the canon. And that's not something you roll up at Valley Forge and stuff with gunpowder. The canon in this case means the standard or the boundary. And they began what was called the canonization process. That delivered to us as believers are 66 books of our Bible. Okay, 39 and 27. Okay, so the 27 books in the New Testament, they went through a process of praying and seeking the Lord, having criteria. And the question was, do we have witnesses from these different bands of generations of the church who can say, yes, Paul wrote that. Yes, I was with him or yes, I heard it or yes, I read it after he wrote it. And so can we authenticate through these different generations that people have quoted these books and assigned them to who they say wrote them? Everybody still with me? And that process was very helpful because there were some books that were contested like second Peter and even some would say Hebrews. And so we began to figure out who wrote these things and how do we think we know who wrote these things. And so in the case of Hebrews, there are a lot in these early bands who feel Paul wrote it. It doesn't tell us for sure, which means for some reason God felt we didn't need to include it. But now that you understand some of these bands of information, let me explain to you. And by the way, when we get to 300, how many have heard of the Latin Vulgate? You may have come out of that past where the Latin Vulgate ruled your roost, right? The Latin Vulgate was translated by Jerome in the 300s. So Jerome was going back to Greek manuscripts, going back two or so hundred years. He's getting sources that are just a hop off of some of the originals or even some that have been derived directly from those originals. And so Jerome in 300 sets a benchmark when he does his Latin to say, this is what it says, which by the way, almost always matches up with your King James. 
this is what it says. So in 300, we got a snapshot of everything above going back to the things the Lord said. So we have a place that says, hey, this is really the right story. A bigger picture than that, there was a group called the Essenes. The Essenes were around at the time of Christ. And when they were called, they were basically the Barnes and Noble. The Essenes carefully copied meticulously scriptures by hand, and they would do this right off of the Dead Sea area in Quan Ram, where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Essenes were there copying carefully the scriptures from before the time of Christ early on. They have this community. They documented everything they did, and they hid everything when the Romans came through, which we'll get to in a minute. So when we found those scrolls, 1947, and eventually got a hold of them for Israel, 1948, and they've even still in the recent times have found a few that were hidden in some of these caves. When they pull them out and looked at them, the Isaiah, for example, and they have everything, I think, for Esther and, um, I can't remember the other one, but they had virtually every book, okay, from the Old Testament. The Isaiah in that Dead Sea Scroll that was hidden from 2,000 years ago is virtually identical, 98 point whatever percent, identical to the Isaiah in your Bible. So we have Jerome giving us a benchmark for the New Testament. These things are accurate. We got the Dead Sea Scrolls giving us a benchmark from basically zero, telling us that our Old Testament Hebrew is accurate. And then we have even before that in 200 BC, 2300 BC, when Alexander the Great came through and everybody learned Greek, the Jews who lost their Hebrew skills took their Hebrew scriptures and translated them into Greek in something called the Septuagint or the LXX for 70 scholars. So we have in 300 BC copies of Daniel going from Hebrew to Greek, copies of Isaiah going from Hebrew to Greek, and on and on and on. Why is that important? Because you will get those who say to you, how do you know you can trust the Bible? How do you know somebody in some generation didn't just add some things to it to make it look more truthful? We're going to need this later for prophecy. Here's how we know. Because we have stamp after stamp after stamp of these things going from Hebrew to Greek, from Hebrew to Greek into Latin, etc., etc., and they're virtually the same. And by the way, in the New Testament, we have some 5,366, at least at the time of the one source I have, Pieces, fragments, scrolls, and books. In other words, we are swimming in textual evidence that is all pretty much in agreement. Sometimes a paragraph is missing. Sometimes a city is misspelled. Sometimes a name is slightly different. Things you expect when you hand copy, but nothing significant to change the core message of this word. So I say this to you because even though we don't know the author of Hebrews, we have extremely good historical authority to say the early church was aware of this book. They clearly felt it was from God. Here are the opinions as to who they think wrote it. And you can see it quoted over and over and over again, as well as all the other epistles. Is everybody still with me? The, half. the bottom line is your Bible has incredible evidence, supernatural in a sense, because think about it. Till you get to the printing press, it's all hand copied. And they're virtually identical to what you have in your lap which means God has preserved his word. So number one, Hebrews included in the Old Testament canon because it was found in a number of writings. And to give you a sum up here, these are the folks who believe Paul wrote it. Clement of Alexandria, 95 AD, first band coming off the apostles. Uh, Palantius, or Pantius, 180 AD. He was a school teacher in Alexandria, Egypt, a center of learning. He felt Paul wrote it. Origen, also in Alexandria, felt that Paul wrote it, but said some wouldn't receive that Paul wrote it. There was already an argument then. Justin Martyr in 140 AD, he said Paul wrote it, quoted from it. Jacob, Bishop of Nisbiz in 325, repeatedly quotes it as a production of an apostle. It's the word of God. Ephraim Sirius, who uh, ascribed it to Paul. We've got Esibus, the bishop of Caesarea, said there are 14 epistles of Paul, which means Hebrews had to be included. He ascribed it to Paul, but also acknowledged there were some who didn't agree that Paul wrote it at that point in the 320s. Archelaus, bishop of Mesopotamia, 300 AD, he said Paul wrote it. Admantius, we're going right down the bands here, 330 said Cyril of Jerusalem, 348 agreed. Council of Laodicea, which is part of that canonization process, 363 they said it was inspired. They felt it was from Paul. Epiphanius, 368. Basil, you perhaps heard of him, 370. Gregory Nazanzian, in 370 agreed. Chrysostom, 398. All claim Paul's the author. Now, the fact is, though, it still doesn't say Paul. The churches surrounding Israel, what would the later the Romans call Palestine, almost all agreed Paul wrote it. You're like, great, you just waited, wasted 10 minutes to tell something that, you know. Well, the reason I do this is we won't know until we get to, to heaven for sure. But here's a question. If Paul did write it, why did he hide his name? 
Well, I can answer that from the book of Acts. Do you remember when he came to Jerusalem? Back in Acts chapter 21, verse 20, he said, Listen, Paul, you see how the Jews have been informed of you, that you teach all the Jews living among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. There was the word on the street that Paul was teaching Jews to forsake Moses. So if you're a Jew trying to figure out whether or not you want to convert to Christ or come to Christ, in a sense, be completed in Christ, and you hear Paul's attached to it, and you hear Paul's got baggage, you might not read the letter. So we'll find out for sure when we get to heaven. But uh, one last thing. <clears throat> There's many things, but this will be the last. A little history. <laughs> Wake up. In 70 AD, well, hold on, let me explain it this way. The Jews began to have an uprising against the Romans starting in 66. What happened? Well, in 66, Flaus, the governor, decided that he was going to expropriate, expro expropriate money out of the temple treasury. So the governor decided to go tap the temple treasury in Jerusalem to get some funds. How do you think that's going to go over the Jews? Not good. So an uprising begins, 66. Cestius Gallius is sent in to try and deal with it. He gets divided from his supply lines, gets to Jerusalem, gets shellacked by the Jews, goes into retreat, realizing he's not going to make it, gets attacked in the retreat. They capture some of his engines of war and other things. They use them eventually later against the Romans when they show up again. So having gotten whooped, it gets back to the emperor, who is Nero, and they can't allow this. You let a province rebel, that's going to take the whole empire down. So they start sending their best soldiers with Vespasian headed towards Jerusalem. He gets there in 68. As he gets there, he's waiting because suddenly Nero dies, as you know, if you've been with us a while, in June of 68. Civil war breaks out within Rome. Well, who's going to run the show? So Vespasian sits quietly, waits, won't attack Jerusalem until he knows what the story is. And lo and behold, guess what happens? Vespasian gets voted in to be emperor. It helps he's got a lot of the army with him right now. And so he eventually goes back to Rome, becomes emperor. And Titus, his son, is now given the job of taking Jerusalem. And he starts the attack on the 14th of Nisan, which is what, pa what, what, ho what holiday? I give it to you. Passover. So he starts attacking on Passover. When the Jews all gather. And the historians tell us, Josephus and others, he sets up four major battering rams and begins, if you know the walls of Jerusalem, here they are hearing just from four directions. They breach the third wall coming in from the northwest. They breach the second wall. They take the fortress Antonia, a lot of battle. Finally take the Temple Mount. And by September, as Jesus said, everything wiped out. They leave only three towers to remain to show how strong the city was, plus to help camp their troops to let everybody know that clearly this was God letting him take that city. That was 70 AD. Now, if you're going to write, you're thinking, what does this have to do with Hebrews? If you're going to write to Hebrews, here's their challenge. They hear the gospel. Who do you write to? The title is to Hebrews. Who are they? They're Hebrews, which would make them Ah, Jews. Okay, what's the story? These Jews are hearing the scriptures, realizing the public testimony of Christ, and are turning to faith in Jesus, hence becoming Christians. The problem is, in the late 60s, Christianity is facing increasing persecution to where Paul gets beheaded and Peter crucified upside down and all that, and then Nero dies, but it keeps going. So here, for a while, until the uprising, Judaism was, was allowed so you come to Christ as a Jew, you begin to face persecution. You go, ooh, you know what? I think I'll just go back to my Judaism and hang out here. When the book of Hebrews says, wait a second, if you've come to Christ, you can't, you can't just leave Christ. You've got to follow him. So these Hebrews are being challenged to want to turn back to the old covenant, the old sacrificial system. And yet the fact is God has given us a new covenant, a sacrifice made once and for all. And when you receive that sacrifice, it pays for all sin. So these are some of the issues being addressed by the writer to the Hebrews. Now, if you're letting them know there's a new covenant, there's a sacrifice once for all, and that's all you need. If Jerusalem had already been destroyed, if the temple worship had already been shut down, don't you think you'd include that? To say, not only did God tell us we'd have a new covenant, hello, go look at Jerusalem, there is no place to worship anymore. Can't you see God has a new covenant? Wouldn't that fit? Wouldn't you include that? I got one. Anybody else? Okay, so the fact is it's not in here, which means the book had to have been written before 70. 68, when all these Roman legions are showing up, it's clear what's going to happen. Don't you think you might have even mentioned, can't you see, we're surrounded, it's about to go down? So it had to probably be written before 68. 
most likely probably written in the mid-60s, 64, 65. So, who wrote it? We're not sure. We think maybe Paul. When? Before Jerusalem fell. Everybody with me? Nice. Verse 1. Here we go. Chapter 1, verse 1, Hebrews. God. Okay, we just lost the atheists. We didn't even get one verse into the book. We just lost the atheists. God. Stated right there. God. You know, I find it interesting. I have children in college. Uh, I've had some graduate and, I, you know, had a little grandbaby at an Eagles game last night. The kids came over. It was kind of fun. They yeah, had them in a Wentz jersey already. Like, wow. Wow, these guys are hard. We just put them in whatever. But, and, uh, but I learned lots of things from them. I've had some of my kids in, in honors programs and graduated extremely high in those programs and all that. And, and they encounter the atheists. See? And what I find interesting is, is the atheists call themselves the free thinkers. Now, if you're a free thinker, why are you afraid of the first word of verse 1, God? They would argue the other way and say, you Christians are so afraid to think of a world without God that oh, you can't handle the reality that there might not be a God. So we refuse to acknowledge God. We're atheists. We don't think he exists at all. We're free thinkers, but you people think there might be a God. You're not free. Wait a second. We lived a life before we met God. <laughs> We know what it's like to try and run your own show. We know what it's like to behave in ungodly fashions. We know what it's like to be in a world without hope, without knowing where you're from, why are you here, where are you going, or having been adopted into God's family. We're not afraid to think of that. We've been there, lived it, and have learned the truth. So we're not afraid to think. We know there's a world coming when God's going to remove his presence, and he's going to send them a strong delusion. We're about to tip into that on Wednesday nights in Isaiah. So not only are we not afraid to think those things, we're free to think them. We know what it means and what the ramifications are. And having understood these things, we've come to Christ. We're free. You're not. But anyway, back to verse one, God, the atheists have already tuned out. They didn't hear that. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers, aha, the fathers, Israel's heritage by the prophets. So one, God exists. Two, he has revealed himself over time to man. How? By speaking to the fathers through the prophets. Prophets. Very important. Back to, how do you know you have the right book? Well, number one, we have just fantastic evidence of the integrity of the scripture. And it's being copied over the millennia. And the fact that it is what it is. And we can look at it again 2,000 years ago, 2,300 years ago. We can go benchmark, 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 benchmark. It is what it is. But not only do we have faithful reproduction of this record, but it is unique to any other record out there. Turn to Isaiah 45. Within this record that has been faithfully copied are some challenges proving it is indeed true. So within itself, it says it is true. Well, anything can say it's true. It not only says it's true, it says here, here is how we're going to prove it's true. So you pick up on Isaiah 45. God says to Israel, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, which have slipped into idolatry. He begins to call them out on it. He says in verse 20, Isaiah 45, Assemble yourselves and come, draw ye near, ye that are escaped of the nations that have no knowledge, they, the nations, have no knowledge, that set up the wood of their graven images, their idols, <clears throat> and they pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Let their idols come and tell you, who hath declared this from the ancient time? Who hath from that time, hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? There is no God else beside me, a just God and a savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. Now, how's he going to prove that? Hang on. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness uh, and it shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Look at chapter 46, verse 5. <clears throat> Excuse me. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? They, in the process of making their idols, lavish gold and silver. They hire a goldsmith. They create these things and they fall down and they carry around their God on their shoulder and they put him in a place and they cry out to him and he can't answer. 
Verse 9, he says this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, here he goes again, and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me. How will we know? Next verse. I will declare the end from the beginning. From the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Interesting. And in verse chapter 48, verse 3, he says, I have declared the former things from the beginning, they went forth out of my mouth, I showed them, I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. So prophecy is how God authenticates he is the only and true God. And you know, therefore, the communication you're getting from him is accurate. So not only is it faithfully copied, but it is supernaturally telling us what's going to happen. Dave Hunt has a book out there called A Woman Rides the Beast, and I want to read to you from chapter 2, just a little section on prophecy. He said this, it's page 19 if you're trying to find it later, about 30% of the Bible is devoted to prophecy, foretelling the future from the past, which God said only he can do. That fact validates the importance of what has become a neglected subject. In marked contrast, prophecy is completely absent from, let me say it again, prophecy is completely absent from the Quran, the Hindu Vedas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramanyaya, Ramayana, the sayings of Buddha or Confucius, the Book of Mormon, or any other writings of the world's religions. They don't have it. This fact alone provides an undeniable stamp of divine approval upon the Judeo-Christian faith, which all other faiths lack. The Bible's prophecies, unblemished record of fulfillment is sufficient to authenticate the Bible in distinction to all other writings as the one and only inerrant word of God. He goes on, just as prophecy is unique to the Bible, so it is unique to the Messiah or Christ. No prophecies foretold the coming of Buddha, Muhammad, Zoroaster, Confucius, Joseph Smith, Mary Baker Eddy, or the current popular Hindu gurus who invaded the West, or any other religious leader, all of whom lack the credentials which distinguish Jesus Christ. Yet, there are more than 300 Old Testament prophecies which identifies Israel's Messiah. 300 plus. Centuries before his coming, and we have him copied into Greek in 300, and we have him faithfully reproduced from time of Christ all the way until we found them in 1947. We not only have them, we know they're accurate. Centuries before his coming, the Hebrew prophets set forth numerous and specific criteria which had to be met by the Messiah. The fulfillment of these prophecies in minute detail in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth demonstrates indisputably that he is the promised one, the true and the only Savior. Okay, so now let's get moving in Hebrews. Yes, please do. Okay, let's go. God, number one, he exists, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake. Number two, he's revealed himself, and within his revelation, he gave tests to prove its authenticity. God at sundry times and in diverse manners spake unto, in time past unto the fathers, by the prophets. Verse 2 at last. Hath in these last days, wait a second, if the 60s, and I don't mean 60s, I mean 60s, not 19, I mean 60. If the 60s were the last days, or the beginning of the last things, where are we now? In these last, the word is eskos or skatos in the Greek, from which we get the study of eschatology. Last is eschatos. Eschatology is the study of the last days. So just call it that so you don't lose everybody. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Interesting. These last days, an appointed time, he spoke to us by his son. Now, Charity, if you would, I want to show you guys again a couple of slides. Oh, no, more history. No, no, even better, geography. Well, oh, that's going to really put us out. Okay, you're looking at roughly a larger Middle Eastern picture. Russia down to Saudi Arabia, Mongolia. This red line here going east is the, how many have heard of the spike, spice or silk route? Silk route, here it is. Here's the silk route or silk route coming across from the east to the west. And look how it works its way through and it ends up in, of all places, 
the coastal line of Israel and Tyre and Sidon. Because here they can get it out to sea in the Mediterranean and head even further west. So you've got the silk and the spice routes going this way as well as down here. You've got trade lines going down into Africa, right? Northern Africa, by the way, the Ethiopian eunuch would run down this way eventually and go home. You've got these routes going up through Turkey, through the Caucasus Mountains. Perhaps you've heard of them in the last 20 years. And you head east, or sorry, head west, and you eventually all the way into England. So you've got all these trade routes. Let me expand on it. Here you have, again, these red lines are harder to see, but here's, again, the silk route, spice route coming in. And they would come through the Middle East, depending on which attack they would take, go over or go under, because you avoid the Arabian Desert. And you get eventually, again, to this area here in Israel. And interestingly enough, one of the key points to control for this is Megiddo. There's going to be a battle there called the Battle of Armageddon, because it controls, it's the small conduit through which you go north to south from Russia down to Africa, and it goes right through there. Solomon controlled it. We've got some 25 levels on this tell, this, this man-made hill. Everybody tried to control Megiddo or Megiddo. And the reason why is because when trade comes through, you can tax it. You thought that was new. So these guys come rolling through and you say, you know, hey, you know, it'd be a real shame somebody like, you know, breaks the legs of your camels. We'll give you five shekels protection money. You thought that was new. It's been going on forever. So not only do you get, quote, protection, but you also get taxed. Or the protection is the tax. So you control this area. You've got the north-south trade, and you've got the silk spice route trying to come in, hit the sea, or go over to, again, Western Europe. And you go all the way to England. Now, this fullness of times... The Babylonians got rolling. You know about them. Then, according to Daniel's prophecy, which was fulfilled in the 300s, the Greeks, the Medo-Persians came in first. Sorry, after Babylon, 539, 300. Then you've got after them, the Medo-Persians decided to try and go and attack Greece. That didn't go well. The Greeks were pretty steamed about it. And eventually, a guy named Alexander, who some call great, shows up, shellacks the Medo-Persians, and by the way, goes all the way to India and spreads throughout this region the Greek language. They run from the 300s down to about 63, and there arises another empire, which again was foretold by Daniel and translated from Hebrew to Greek in 300 BC. They show up in 63, we call them the Romans, and they take over and eventually divide into two legs, Eastern and Western Empire. So you've got a number of things, the fullness of time. One, trade routes. And everybody likes to stop off at Israel, in particular, a great place to be refreshed is the Sea of Galilee. Everybody's coming through here. God sends his son when there's a common language, Greek as well as Latin, when there are the Roman roads which get them all throughout this empire, and he plants them right in the area of the Sea of Galilee. He made Capernaum his home, and there he performs all those different miracles prophesied some 800 years before that the people who saw these things and heard these things would then scatter all over their known world talking about this son of God who showed up to Galilee who did these miracles. Now you can begin to understand the fullness of time. Everybody still with me? Great. Now let's get into Hebrews. Okay, history lesson is over. Geography lesson is over. The lights are back. Please wake up and join us. I know I've lost some of you, but it was a good sleep. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, when conditions were right, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. Everything belongs to him. In fact, when he came, he died, and he rose again. He redeemed this world to himself. This world, and in particular his church, we are on layaway. Now, some of you don't remember layaway, but as a kid, layaway was the way you did things. See, you buy something, they lay it away for you in a little shelf under the store. And I mean, terrible supply chain management strategy, but back in the day, it was great. And so you were basically paying until you paid it all off, and then you come get it back off of layaway. See, well, we're on layaway. We were paid for, and we're just waiting on the shelf till the Lord comes back and says, it's mine. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom his son also he made the worlds. We are a unique and special creation of God. And it tells us in Romans, the things that are clearly made are seen by the invisible things that God has created, and people kind of laugh at that. And then we found protons and neutrons and electrons, and then our technology got even better, and then we found even subparticles that create those things. 
and they're not sure why is it holding together. It tells us right here. Not only did he create all things, but in him all things consist. He holds it all together. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, and that's aeon or ages. It's interesting because there's also the idea of, you know, the Lord has made not only this earth, but heaven for the Jews. There are three heavens. First heaven where the birds fly. Second heaven, space, outer, you know, outer space, stars. Third heaven, the very presence of God. He's made the world. All ages, all things. He's created everything. So he hath in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he's appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who, his son, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things, it all holds together by him, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Nice. So, number one, God. Number two, has revealed himself over time to man. Number three, in the final fullness of time, his final revelation of himself to this world is he became a man, the God-man. And in that act of incarnation and taking on humanity, he would come, live sinless, die and rise again so that he could reconcile and bring back to himself in the fellowship this world that he made. And there's only one thing he asks you to do. Believe his word. Trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You don't have to know how to solve special math equations. You don't have to have the whole history timeline I gave you, but you have to be convinced in your heart, not only has God sent his son to save this world from their sins, but he gave us a record that has withstood every generation's attempt to destroy it. It's outlived them all. And the more we study, the more we dig, the more we research, the more we know is the best source you'll ever get your hands on. So the question is, do you believe him? Fine. So he has spoken to us through his son. What did he say? We're out of time. We'll pick it up here next week. You only got two verses. Well, it's better than one. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, how we thank you for your word. And Lord, may that hopefully help us to trust you. You know the end from the beginning. David, as well as other scriptures, say you know every hair in our head. You know our thoughts before we speak them. You know, in a number of our days, there is nothing that surprises you. And so, Lord, how I pray for anyone here today that is listening. Maybe some of the free thinkers came back for the end. But how I pray, Lord, that they might finally understand, not only have you spoken to this world, but you have spoken in such a way that we can have full assurance it is you. You are the only true God. And as you said in Isaiah, if anyone would look unto you, they will be saved. Thank you for these things, Lord. Strengthen our faith and help us to be excited when people ask us the reason for the hope that's in us because we've met the true and living God. Thank you for these things, Lord. Go with your people this week in Jesus' name. Amen.